Welcome digitally to the Pitt Rivers Museum. My name is Josie Kettle and I'm part of the public engagement team at the museum and also the research team. Firstly, a huge thank you to John, who you've just seen pop up, who has brought tonight's event together. John's spent a great deal of time weaving together a framework to support the discussion and connecting our incredible speakers. Tonight, John will share a discussion about what happens to spaces left behind at the Pitt Rivers Museum now that human remains have been removed from public view and what opportunities for new ways of working and connecting might be opening up as a result of this removal. This is a really timely and important discussion, so thank you for curating this, John. A little bit about what this event is about for the museum. So this event is part of our Radical Hope Beyond the Museum series, and these events aim to explore contemporary changes in museums and to reimagine museum practice. These events focus on how Western museums have relied on colonial ideas that have obscured nuance, hidden diversity in ways of knowing, and erased lived experiences in favour of promoting one viewpoint, that of a seemingly omnipotent, yet also supposedly neutral curatorial voice. The reimagined museum should be a place that supports all people to share their ways of knowing and tell their stories through their own voice. The Radical Hope series is led by researchers and global community partners from around the world and on picks colonial practices. And we are supported by Torch, who are the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. So thank you, Torch, and over to John. Hello, my lovely friends. Wherever you're joining us at whatever time of the day and whether you're on catch up or live in the session, an incredibly warm welcome from me. This space that we have created explores what it means to access removal from an engagement perspective. It's really important to start this session by stating that this is not a space where we are debating the removal. The removal has happened. The removal has happened for positive reasons. This space is not here to debate that. This space is specifically from an engagement oh. and learning perspective to look at what comes next to have honest and open conversations around the nature of removal, what that nature means to people and how professionals, curators, activists, and those that really care about these collections work together in order to not provide solutions, but work through alternatives and ways of engaging. Engaging around a subject that can be incredibly divisive, but ultimately is one of the things that we all have in common, a love of these collections and how these collections can tell powerful stories. Engagement is a powerful vehicle to consider how we move forward from the decision to remove them in positivity and togetherness, which is the tone of our session today. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. So, the session's aims, values, and emotion. In this space, first and foremost, we're gonna set out and I'm gonna set out to try and earn your trust in terms of this conversation. It's not presumed or expected in terms of the dialogue that we're about to have, but I will work very hard and put my heart into hopefully gaining your trust to have an honest and productive conversation around this, conversa around this topic. This is a values led space, which means that we fully acknowledge the emotion that's happening behind it, but we are working on a framework of productivity and positivity. We are moving forward, not necessarily looking for solutions, but having a dialogue, a dialogue which I believe is very important to have in public spheres like this, in order for people to see what goes on within institutions, in order for people across our industry and those that love these collections to come together to have dialogue. Dialogue about what matters to us and the emotion that goes with this is palpable and really powerful. One of the things I'm keen to acknowledge in this space is that a number of words, themes, or the conversation itself has the capacity to wound and hurt people. That is not diminished in any way by us doing this session or the, the conversations that we're about to have. What it does mean though, hopefully, this is a consensual space that you enter into, mindful of your well-being, but also mindful that we are working towards positive inclusion and inclusive futures. Hopefully we will gain your trust during that conversation, but we know that historical distance does not mitigate any pain and that the words and the conversation itself carries a number of baggage and wounds and emotional toil as we work through these subjects. We seek to do so with positivity. We seek to do so with inclusion and we seek to do so not necessarily finding solutions, but very much in the spirit of these sessions. I hope that through togetherness and sharing, we create something new. 
please be mindful of that as we continue as in generally that some images may come up that you may find disturbing there won't be any human remains featured within this and i've been very mindful in terms of the content however we will touch on some of the uh, some of the conversations around santa or shrunken heads in popular culture the engagement of the emotion on removal is extraordinary and it's really interesting to ground this conversation first and foremost in what has happened. The Santa or shrunken heads, and we'll move between the two terms as we go on during this space, just to be as accessible as possible in terms of the conversation, is a huge topic, but it's rooted within a wider activity that happened in the summer of 2020, which is that a number of collections and or human remains, over a hundred pieces, were removed during the closure of the museum during the COVID pandemic as a way to move forward, a way to move forward on inclusion, as, a, as part of a larger conversation that had been happening years before and will continue years on into the future about inclusion and about the voices, the voices of specifically the collections and how they're used. The Santa or the Shrunken Heads have become iconic within this conversation, much in the same way that they're iconic in terms of how people viewed the collection at Pitt Rivers, or ne not necessarily true, but how people view Oxford to a certain extent. The shrunken heads, the Santas, have a mythology around them. They have a pull, they have a historical tourist attraction element that is powerful and rooted in the conversations and the experiences of a number of people they seem to have come to the forefront in terms of this conversation and it's those that we can latch on to when we're debating engagement around the removal we're conceptualizing we're imagining what if and we're being hopeful that is what we're going to be focusing on today now the shrunken heads is a long and convoluted and very powerful emotional story that starts with the shah tribe and the shah culture but expands and balloons out into a wider conversation around colonialism and decolonization that is quite extraordinary in its scope. Whereas the heads themselves started out as not trophies, but a captured soul essentially, as part of conflict within that culture. With the introduction of colonialism and colonial traffic to the culture and the tribe itself, what was fascinating is that colonialism drove a desire for more and more heads, a desire beyond the original scope of what the heads did and what the heads meant to that indigenous culture. The heads ballooned out into a huge narrative on acquisition, almost to an, extent, an arms race in terms of different institutions, trying to buy up as many as possible, which fueled a inverted commas tourist industry and tourist trade in the creation of these objects. Whereas once they originally symbolized conflict and um, reflection and reclamation on souls and captured souls and the power of those souls, what they became instead was a commercialized version of a culture the, the West and Western institutions could latch onto that moved far beyond the origins of these people and instead became a conversation around our view on, on uh, the world, our view on accessing different cultures. Colonial biops, it resulted in a huge variety of Santa and shrunken heads that stopped essentially being around human remains to a certain extent. And that's evident in the Pitt Rivers collection. Very few of the Santa are actually human remains. The majority else are composed animal parts or reimagined other objects. But what is fascinating about it is that the humanism of these objects was stretched to a point where it very rarely or no longer speaks about its origins and instead speaks about us in terms of our culture, our history in the West and acquisitions within institutions. Using the heads as a vehicle for this conversation, I believe is really, really powerful because we can trace that and we can map that and it has a specific engagement function. The text that has been used in the redisplay of where the Santa used to be for me is one of the most powerful pieces of text I've read in a long time. 
it speaks to me not only about the decision, but there is an intellectual intelligence about the wording that is startling. So the word racism is used in connection, but then Pitt Rivers has gone further and it has listed reactions, reactions that contribute to a sense of racism, that contribute to a sense of colonialism, that is upsetting and distressing for Shah partners, but also I would suggest in terms of wider society, contemporary representation of diversity right now is affected as much as the indigenous culture from where these objects first came from. Freak show, gory, gruesome, savage. These are shocking and powerful and painful words to use in association with not only your ancestors, but your ancestral culture and wider conversations around diversity. Again, we've gone so far from their origins. We're having a conversation about colonization and decolonization, I believe, when we access the heads. It's emotionally intelligent that this has been acknowledged in the text that has gone before it. And it's also really powerful, I would suggest, to consider how pervasive the concept of the shrunken head and human remains are in terms of our culture. On the screen, for example, are three very powerful examples of how they are pictured. So in Beetlejuice, for example, one of the central comedic characters has had their head shrunk. Similarly, in Night in the Museum, the Shrunken Head Sing Along and the Goosebump series has prominently featured shrunken heads, both in terms of visual puns and in terms of literary puns as well. Each of these moments, I would suggest, are designed to, in our sociology to make these conversations softened or safe or palatable or particularly child friendly as in the case of Harry Potter where I believe and I've had a look and I've seen that uh, a well-beloved English actor is the voice of a shrunken head, a recognisable character within the Harry Potter franchise. Everything about our sociology tells us and leads us towards a place where these objects are safe acceptable and furthermore I would argue completely divorced not only from their origins and humanity but the spirituality of these objects as well. They're in our homes, they're on our TVs, on our screens, in our phones, they've been commercialized to a point where the intellect and emotion around them is deadened. Take that one step further and consider, for example, the idea that these objects and the conversations around shrunken heads are introduced to us as vehicles from trusted sources, from people that we know and love. We are, we are brought up to go to museums by teachers that we trust. Our parents or our families show us these objects in trust with us believing and them believing in themselves that these are safe and acceptable narratives. What happens? when Pitt Rivers, one of the institutions that we are culturally brought up and the West perpetuates the belief is that museums and institutions like ours hold the answer, the final, you know, the final, um, the final solution in terms of how we move forward with a problem. What's fascinating about that is we, that institution is adding the word racism and removing these objects away from people. What is the emotional reaction that happens as a result of that? For me, there's an exciting moment where there is a removal of the emotional oxygen that happens associated with racism, with decolonization, and the, the opportunity to create something new. And I think nothing says that more than the next slide I'm gonna show, which is one of the labels from the Santa itself. Now, no human remains are pictured in here. They are referenced. Please be mindful of our session values and your own well-being as we move forward. I'm going to go to the next slide. This example is key, I believe, in terms of understanding this debate. And one of the Santas that is has been removed is a sloth's head, a two-toed sloth's head. Now, sloths have this iconography for being sleepy and smiley and cute and sweet and they were part of that collection. It's one of the pieces that's been removed. For me, it typifies this conversation that we're having that you couldn't get anything less cute or more adorable than the sloth. The safety imbued in that is not, however, referenced in that label, which you can see. There is an intellectual atlism happening in the label 
And then there's an emotion happening within these objects that sometimes is at odds in terms of how audiences access that. And it can leave audiences in a huge dilemma. If this is a new conversation for a number of audiences, if this is a, the introduction of a new concept, it can be really challenging, it can be frightening, it can be liberating, it can be exciting, or it can be threatening. And I think as engagement professionals, we need to acknowledge that that is the arena that we're entering from the start, as we find positive and inclusive solutions around something that has happened. Now, for me as an engagement specialist, I'm gonna theorize what if. I'm gonna put forward three different scenarios and three different ideas. I'd like these ideas to form in your thinking as we meet our speakers coming up next and we have those conversations. Because please do send through your own ideas. Please do let us know in the chat, speculate and talk to each other about how you feel and what you would like to see. So my first one is contemporary art sold through the collectors themselves rather than collections. And I apologize sincerely for that typo, that awful typo that snipped through. Empowering or diversive. If we have a conversation around the collectors themselves rather than the collections, what are we setting ourselves up for? Is it controversial? Is it painful? Is it liberating? What would that do? Taking the focus away from the collections and putting it instead on the collectors themselves. Option number two, what if contemporary art creates a new opportunity? Now, for me, as reference, when we remove racist narratives and ideas around racism, the emotional oxygen that that allows and opens up within the space is extraordinary. This project that you can see on the screen is a project I did at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery uh, about three years ago now, and it was a consensual donation of body parts digitally. So via 3D scanning, people came into the museum and as part of a conversation around contemporary diversity, they donated their body parts. They took, they took ownership of that space. They took ownership over the acquisition and turned that narrative around. The historical acquisition was non-consensual by having a consensual addition of themselves marking their diversity. I truly believe you cannot see what you cannot be. Therefore, to occupy these spaces, either digitally or physically, in terms of contemporary diversity, I think is an amazing opportunity. What if people consensually donated themselves to be seen within that space, refilling the gap that now exists? Or option number three, what if the empty spaces remains? Now, in Pitt Rivers, the saturation of the collection is extraordinary. It's a, it's a consensual maze that we enter. We go in there for a sense of positive suffocation. There is so much to see. You could never see it all in a week, a year, possibly a lifetime. But in the midst of that, as you can see on the screen, there is now a clear signage in the housing case, the historical housing case of where the remains used to be. It stands out starkly from its surroundings as a moment of collection and it really symbolizes for me what happens when we stop looking at the collection we start looking at the emotion behind it instead so what happened if, what happens if we keep that that empty space does it play into the hands of arguments that suggest decolonization will leave institutions empty em, empty and destitute that there will be these awful painful moments of erasure or instead does it highlight that erasure for a positive and, and useful and productive purpose? To explore that, I would like to meet our speakers and to find out more. Our first speaker, Ashley Almeida, is a, a specialist in terms of engagement, currently at the British Museum, who has a strong history in terms of engagement and volunteering. Ashley brings a wealth of experience in terms of working with people on uh, collections that involve human remains and the emotion and the engagement behind it. Liam Wiseman is a member of Arts Council England. He is a senior engagement figure, somebody that works across uh, large swathes of the UK and is involved in larger conversations around decolonisation, specifically noted for his work with the Museums Association on decolonisation. Angela van Brockhoven is a, sorry, Laura van Brockhoven, I do apologise, uh, is the director of Pitt Rivers and brings with her a wealth of experience as one of the leading figures in terms of the museums and arts sector and followed not least by Angela Billings, a researcher, scholar, activist and 
uh, the most amazing figure that we're going to speak to last that is going to talk about the nature of the engagement happening right now. So to move forward, I'd like to meet our first speaker, Ashley Almeida. Ashley, would you like to pop on your screen and say hello? Hello. Hi. Hi. So picking up this conversation, and thank you so much for being here, Ashley. It's so lovely to be with you. I'm really interested in the emotional immediacy of these objects and what that means from an engagement perspective. We've already touched on it previously, but could I ask you to reflect on the idea of the size of the objects and notions of safety around these objects, particularly mm. And yeah, it's interesting you mentioned size, and I think there's something about things just being small that for many people just lends a sort of benign aspect to them. There's something small, therefore there is an innocence to them, which in this case really belies, you know, that these objects are human remains. And I think because of that small size, it just, it, you know, it really divorces people from the reality of it and really feeds into essentially you know what this is really all about which is othering um i mean you know the majority of museum collections really are looking at objects in a sense of these things are different from the objects that i know and understand and you know in that way we, we kind of other them um but it's that there's something about them just being small that i think really just um it makes it, it, I think it makes people feel like it's okay to, to look at them in that very detached, divorce way. Yeah. That small equals cute, allegedly, or the idea Alleged. that the smallness almost develops a sense of ownership or protectiveness over these objects? I mean, perhaps protectiveness, yes. I mean, you know, think about sometimes people carry things that are small because there's some sort of protective charm or something but um yeah just that you know that they're, they're they're small they're innocent they're cute uh, i think that's how you know people see small cute things you look at small animals for example and we see them in a very innocent light and perhaps and they are of course but we then take that very basic idea of small equals cute and ascribe it to everything which in this case is ascribed to human remains and is that right is that something that you know for, for a child for example looking at things they will just see that as oh these are really interesting objects but make no further kind of connection um you know as you know, the museum itself has said that they were not displayed with the kind of relevance that they ought to with the story about them and therefore you know I, I just don't think that people would really appreciate what they are so um, you know I'm glad that we're having this conversation that well more so that they're also have they've been removed from display and there's a wider conversation I would suggest following on from that about objectification of these objects then that we move yeah. beyond safety and we're so divorced from the fact that these are human remains that these are skin these are flesh these are eye orbs these contain a living and functioning soul as according to the culture that they originate from yeah you absolutely more about the objectification of, of objects and your experience of human remains in general yeah so i mean i used to work in um in archaeology and that was a lot of my role was going into schools and kind of talking about what we were doing and leading sessions about how we kind of analyze skeletons and you know I was coming at it from a sort of engagement and science perspective but for children they you know they just the first thing they want to know is are these things real and of course no they're not we can't obviously take you know remains to school um but they just kind of they you know there's no sort of appreciation of that that was once a living being in any way um and so it's 
for many people just easy to kind of look at them as just in a vet as you see it as we've said very detached way of like this is just an object you know th there are numerous museums around the world that have things like mummies on display and many of them are you know criticized by people saying why are these on display do they need to be because actually looking at them what are you really learning from that being on display you know I, you, you don't learn anything about the, the the burial practices the rituals associated with that you're just looking at the remains of what was once a person with no appreciation of that person and that that i'm not saying this very articulate but that, that was a person that was an actual being um and yeah it's it's when you're sort of you know when you're going into schools and kind of talking about these things people find it fascinating because they don't know about it but and you start to kind of disassociate yourself and then you have to remind yourself no actually we are talking about real remains here um and it's a it's a strange thing um to just kind of look at these these things in a very detached way um yeah yeah, and it can be really painful as well. And I think for a number of us that work in museums or galleries and inhabit these spaces or spend time regularly within these spaces, you're right, they become the backdrop of where people work or their social lives or where they meet people or where they go on school trips. And there's that continual disassociation with the fact that these were people. From a learning engagement perspective, how do we recapture that sense that these were spirits, these were people, these were referred to as souls? How is learning a good vehicle for us to reconnect with these conversations after we've de-established the concept that these are now safe or unsafe? How do we bridge that gap? Mm. And I think that's the tricky part now to understand what, what to do because clearly, something needs to happen with that and i to be quite frank i don't have the answer to, to what that is but definitely some learning some kind of understanding of the history of what the the original ideas of this and also the you know you talked earlier about how this became essentially a, a trade and how these objects simply became because of the 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 nature of that being a trade they they became curios essentially but like people just wanted to look at them from like a in a sort of memento kind of way um so i think that needs to you know really be added into the story to say you know, this is what happened this is what can happen when you basically objectify people as and other them in, to such an extent that their lives their practices are nothing more than something you take home to keep as a curio. Which is incredibly painful. I think mm. for anyone facing that level of objectification, but you're right, the othering creates and the, the safety net that our society has woven around the conversation of the heads in particular creates such an emotional distance. I think there's a there's an acceptability without we you know with a you know without finding a better phrase to say it, an acceptability in terms of how easily people access that. Yeah. Yeah, and it sort of makes you wonder, well, why do we accept it? Um, and I, th I think it's just, we just, uh, as a society, just l are quite happy to just other things with, with you know, especially museums, they're, they're, they're products of imperialism, ultimately, to showcase, look at the things I've brought back from conquering mm -hmm. other countries. Um, and you know, in that sense, we're, we're very good at othering things. And yeah, I don't know how to kind of end that. But. I have one final question for you before we move on to our next speaker. And that's, what do you hope for the future now that this removal has happened? I hope for greater dialogue. I think um communication understanding one another is really the bedrock for moving on um 
we have to kind of understand the past. And I think there has to be an acceptance that there was there is a very painful past for many objects in museums, not only these. And in order to to move on from that, that acceptance has to happen and therefore and dialogue needs to happen as part of that. And it will not be easy. And I think that's that's another thing that has to really be learned is that moving on is not an easy thing to do. You have to accept that it will be an awkward and uncomfortable thing, um, but that is the only way that you will move on and create greater kind of meaning. Ashley Almeida, your kindness, sharing and your big heart is really valued in this space. Thank you so much. And Thank I will you. see you for the question section at the end. Okay. To our lovely audience at home, please do keep the conversation alive. Respond to how you feel about Ashley sharing. Keep speculating about what could be, what could be made, what you would like to see. Explore those ideas with each other, share your emotions, and please do so with a sense of kindness and togetherness. As I bring on my next guest, Liam Wiseman. Liam, would you like to bring your screen on for us? There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really interested picking up on Ashley about on the concept of removal how useful is it and how welcome is it i'm conscious that your perspective in terms of national trends and being involved in national movements gives us a really interesting and key viewpoint on that question can i ask you from your perspective how how welcome useful is removal yeah i mean um <laughs> for me absolutely yes i i think uh, just from a personal perspective um because I wanted to give a little, a little bit of an, uh, you know, a, a, an example of a situation I've been in, um, in a different museum with a very different context and a very different set of uh, sort of objects. But, um, I, you know, in, in my job, I work with a lot of different museums across the country. I spend a lot of time in museums, where I, I did before the pandemic. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to explore and be around a lot of museums and museum people, which is, is great. But then, Every now and then you see examples of really sloppy curation or really sloppy interpretation that whilst it, you know, might have been completely well-meaning and coming from the right place, doesn't land or doesn't land in the way that people would, would want or expect it to. So the example I was going to talk about was um, uh, I, I went to in 2019 uh, a museum in Hertfordshire. Uh, it was a museum that was just reopening after uh, having a capital redevelopment so it, it wasn't like it was <laughs> it always you know been that way it was it was new they'd had the chance to refresh the collections and everything and most of it was great but then walked past a section on children's toys and in that cabinet there was just a gollywog sat there um, you know with with no interpretation no explanation for for what this object is, what it means, what it rep represents, what it has meant in the past, and, and how people respond to it now. And I'm always of the opinion that if you are going to, to show something like that, if you're going to have either a racist object on display or a controversial object in, in whatever way, it absolutely needs that extra level of interpretation. It needs that, you know, conversation to be had, and it needs the engagement. And that you can't, you, you know, it's, it's not that we shouldn't have those objects on display ever, or that there's not a place for that. But if you're going to do it, you have to do it in a way that's sensible and sensitive and it comes from a point of understanding. So for me, I think that <laughs> I, I'm glad that, that these objects were actually taken off display um, because I, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that for shrunken heads. You know, I don't know how, how do you uh, provide a really robust context for that kind of object and you know what is obviously not just an object but was it was a human at one time you know what is human remains um but then you look at you know and, and, and you you've sent around to me before this um it's very well publicized um uh, uh statistics from from the yougov which examined how people felt about uh, Britain's colonial past in the UK today. And 
you know, it says that 37% of people feel ambivalent about empire. They don't feel like it was either a good or a bad thing. It's just something that happened. And then you look at 32% of people felt proud of it. And 19% of people thought it was a source of shame. The rest didn't know. The rest didn't want to make a judgment or a call on that. Um, and so you think, well, <laughs> do, do people really care? As, as a start, I mean, uh, uh, but, uh, but also are these people, the people that go into museums, are, they, are, they, are these people that um, don't, even, don't, don't want to say that empire was good or bad, do they have an interest in history? You know, uh, and are they the people we should be engaging? I think absolutely they're the people we should be engaging because they haven't made that decision yet. They haven't come to a point where they can feel like we know what was, you know, either what was right or wrong or however you want to phrase it. Um, those are the people that need that context. Those are the people that really need to have these conversations with. Whereas the people that have already, you know, if they if they've chosen, then they've chosen. It's, it's hard to change people's minds. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? <laughs> I just rambled a little bit. <laughs> um, and, and that that example of the children's toy is like a lightning bolt of emotion for me as well, because it very much plays to the idea that time and distance equals that sense of safety and that the farther back something is the more we can disassociate ourselves from it whereas i think that toy is a really powerful example of an object that very viscerally caused their own emotion within me never mind people that connect on a more deeper level in terms of that object there's also i think a perspective on removal of objects like this on funding and funding streams. Could you speak more on that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really interesting because, you know, working for the Arts Council is is a bit of a weird position to find yourself in. Um, on the one on the one hand, you know, we are an arms link government body. Um, we are there to support cultural organisations of all types across the country. Um, but in a lot of cases, we end up having to follow the party line from government essentially on uh on on how we operate and the kind of things we encourage that said i think we've we've done really well at, at encouraging our cultural organizations to embrace diversity and inclusion to try and think about their inclusivity and their relevance going forward uh, you know especially for museums where with a with a country and a population that's going to be increasingly multicultural over you know it's already multicultural but it's only going to get more multicultural if you're a museum that's still on the fence about this sort of thing, you are going to be left behind. There's no two, there's no two ways about that. You need to start this process of really engaging with the material that people find uh, controversial or confusing or upsetting and, you know, make sure that you're actually having those conversations. So that's what we would really encourage. Um, to, that, to that end, the funding is available there. And, and I think a lot of museums think because organizations like the Arts Council are an extension of the government and this government, do, you know, to be frank, doesn't particularly want to see this kind of thing happen. They are leveraging which doesn't really make sense, but um, <laughs> that is what it is. Um, yeah, uh, you know, but we're not. We, we are an independent body and we want to see this kind of work happen. We've been working with the Museums Association on providing decolonization guidance. We're working on providing updated restitution or repatriation guidance guidance. And we realize, you know, as an organization, the importance of having these conversations and being able to have them now before the situation for museums gets worse and before museums are constantly receiving, you know, and museums fairly already receive a lot of backlash for uh, not doing things in a timely or effective manner sometimes. But it's going to get worse as people learn more about this kind of thing. And as uh, you know, as we've seen over the past year with the conversation around my most hated phrase, contested heritage, um, it's in the public, it's in the public realm. It is out there. People know about it. People are talking about it. People are seeing statues being torn down in Bristol. People are um, watching us as there are debates constantly on what is acceptable or what isn't. And we can't shy away from that because it is there. It's happening. And I think it's good that this, this moment has, has happened here where we can actually have these conversations. And again, we don't have to be the ones to decide whether something is, is right or wrong or whether it's appropriate, but what is important is that we figure out what to do now when 
it's happening. It, it, it's too late to change. It's too late to stop that. So I think one thing that you can do, you know, if you, if you, if you work for a museum or if you're a museum specialist, you should be applying for, for funding opportunities. You should be applying to do research, to understand uh, this kind of material, to figure out what are the interesting ways to respond to it, because we can absolutely fund research and development projects like that, which allow you to, to experiment and see what, what people respond to and how they respond to it well. And as engagement professionals, experimentation is, is all part of the job. So yeah, I, I think museums should absolutely be taking initiative and taking the lead to do this kind of thing. And if they need more money, they know where to come. I love the concept of hope that comes through in terms of what you're saying, because you're absolutely right. This is a conversation that is going to be happening irregardless of any actions uh, that museums or museum professionals take. This is out there. It's more important, I think, that the custodians of those collections are active voices within these and active voices in terms of progressive and inclusive heritage and futures for people. I think that also very much speaks to your perspective that you mentioned on how this, this decision by Pitt Rivers sits more within a national perspective than just happening in Oxford and just happening with those objects. I have one final question for you before I very reluctantly give you up, which mm -hmm. is, what do you hope for on this removal? I, I hope that whatever comes next has a purpose and has a positive purpose and could be something that, I don't know, people can rally around, people can understand, people that can galvanize people, that can enable them to have conversations, to start talking about really tricky subjects like racism that people often so often sweep under the carpet, just pretend like it doesn't exist, pretend like it's not a real thing. Um, we should absolutely be able to embrace the conversation around Britain's colonial past and, uh, you know, why do Europe's colonial past as well, because it's not going anywhere, it's history, it's happened, but that doesn't mean it can be forgotten about. It means that, and as museum professionals, again, we're not in the business of trying to forget things. We want to bring that up again and again and have those conversations. Um, so I'm hopeful that it, whatever that space becomes, and if it's, if it's a, you know, if it just remain, if it remains an empty space that can, you know, and that in, its, in itself obviously is actually said can have an impact and can, you know, start those conversations regardless then that has more value to me than those heads did in terms of, you know, their shock appeal, I guess, for people, you know, or the morbid curiosity that people had about them. I think it absolutely has more value to society and our conversations and our dialogue than those heads ever did. Liam, I'm very reluctant to give you up because your warmth and kindness and your generosity in the space is hugely appreciated. Thank you so much. And I'll see you for the questions at the end, if that's okay. Everyone in the chat, everyone at home watching either live or on catch up, please do let us know what you think. Keep speculating about what could happen or what you would like to see happen, the vehicles by which that could happen. Respond emotionally of how you're feeling to the sharing so far from Ashley and Liam. Let us know in the comments what you think and what you feel. Uh, share with others. You bring this space alive. As you do so, I'm going to bring in my next guest, Lara. Lara, would you like to put your screen on for me? Hi, Dom. A warm welcome, Laura. We've had the most fantastic conversation so far about different aspects of removal, both in terms of emotional dynamics, in terms of national dynamics. I'm keen to talk to you as somebody that straddles both of those conversations, but is also somebody that is having these conversations on the ground right now, that is involved in the engagement of these objects and is steering and being part of conversations that's happening around it right now. I think for my first question, can I ask you to share with us Pitt River's response to the responses, how that's gone, the course that you've taken, and the hope that has emerged as a result of that? Yeah, so um, I think that the responses started, you know, many, many years ago to um, and, and, and have been a constant, right? One when the uh, there was even a hint at when, for example, the government guidance changed in 2006 or so, I think, uh, around human remains, not actually not um, only being on display if 
people were warned, when they would run into them, um, and only if you would have, have spoken to the, um, you know, to, to uh, communities that were uh, descendant communities, for example. And all of that, we knew we were in breach of those. So we, we have been discussing that. Laura Pierce had tried to make changes to the display. And then there was an MA thesis and a PhD thesis, actually, that had studied what are people saying, what are people getting out of these displays, and the constancy of sort of um, what we were hearing, and also when we were doing the ethical review of all of our displays, it was really clear that, one, we were not curating this display in a way that it could be understood, as Ashley and Liam were also saying. Two, we were continuing to be in government breaching of, of government guidance, and three, um, one of the things that I, you know, because because my um, specialty uh, is on, on the Americas, I had been working with Schwar delegates, for example, in a project um, from 2017, together with other institutions in Ecuador, and it was really clear that people were saying, actually, we don't want to be put on display in this way. Obviously, you know, as was mentioned in, by some people in the chat, it wasn't just the shrunken heads, that and it was not just the tzantza that were on display, there were you know, 120 human remains on display from many different communities. And while the tzantza is the one that everybody sort of somehow, to my astonishment, was so upset about, on the other hand, it was very much other human remains of other communities. And I think that's where the reactions have been mixed. So on the one hand, there were reactions of people um, that in mean of indigenous communities saying, we want you to stop putting us on display and we want to be involved in the way that you're putting you know, human remains on display and any object actually of our communities on display. So that's the process that we're starting to do more and more of. And you know, so, um, so that's one part of the uh, process. The other uh, part was really that uh, when we have taken the decision to, to take the human remains off display, um, I. We, we talked about how are we going to, you know, we're going to have an empty case. We're going to have some places where there's just going to be empty spaces. We can leave those empty, that's fine. And we can jig around and, and actually talk about why we've taken them off display. But there's going to be one case, which is the treatment of dead enemies case. That's going to be completely empty. So we just, first we decided, shall we just take away the case? But then we said, no, actually, we need to talk about why uh, we're taking these uh, human remains off display. And so when I was writing the text that was that is now on display, it, I thought it was really important for us to, on the one hand, we were showing transparency, accountability, openness about the human remains we still have in our care and what we were going to do with them. And, and, and some of that will be returning the human remains in other um, aspects. It might be that you know some communities might want the human remains to go back on display, but they want to be involved in that display. The other thing I wanted to make sure that we were explicitly um, going to do is to bring in some of the indigenous peoples and experts' voices. So through quotes that are actually saying we want to be buried, have the human right to be buried and stay buried. Um, and other communities also saying how, how it makes them feel when we are putting their bodies on display and how problematic and how painful that is. And then the other aspect that I wanted to make sure is that we were very specific about how our curation had not been sufficient and actually was perpetuating racist and stereotypical um, ideas and how our disciplines of archaeology and anthropology have been very much part of a of a really problematic uh, process of you know this this entitlement of white people to objectify black brown and female bodies for their entertainment their research their learning as if you know people um, are just there as if they're objects. And I think that is one of the things that indigenous communities obviously have been talking about a lot. And so once that was done, we wanted to make sure that in the conversations that we were having, we were being really clear. Um, and actually that's why we chose to go out to the press and have a press release. Also to uh, make sure that our um, staff was uh, really well trained and knew um, why we were doing this um, and knew how to deal with really difficult conversations. And then we started to receive lots of messages, emails, letters. Some were handwritten that were expressing people's heartfelt emotions, often of anger, of being upset, sometimes of relief and happiness. And I started to, on the one hand, receive those letters and on the other hand, receive messages from indigenous communities and indigenous um, experts who were indicating how relieved they were that finally now, and this is not just the schwa, 
but it's actually also you know lots of different other uh, parts of the world that finally now maybe they would be able to start a conversation on how to return to get this object the, the the human remains their ancestors returned able to finally come to the museum now that we weren't showing um and we we were actually showing that we were willing to listen and take um, seriously, their emotion of pain and violence that the display of human remains was causing for them, but also um, able to engage with us, maybe to decide what would be the next steps. And then um, just so some of the, the letters that I received and the emails were really um, difficult to look at and to understand and to sort of see how can we still have a conversation? How do we move forward with this? How do we bridge this real divide and showing this sort of entitlement of I need to have these things for my enjoyment and my learning and my kids were learning and their stories being told. Um, and so what, what I, um, I was really lucky and, and this is sort of a bridge to Angela, I suppose, but um, that um, a colleague from Goldsmith, um, uh, Trisha, she, who's, a, who's a professor there, she contacted me whether uh, there was anything that I would like to have investigated. And we were there with you know, all of that information. I wanted to be able to write back to people having really listened and seen what are the things that people are upset about um, and how do we move on from this conversation. Obviously, you know, the context also, so both nationally has really hardened. I think the context of social media is also a really problematic one uh, where, um, and I'm sure Angela is going to go into the detail of that. Um, but also the context of Oxford and removal is one that is very timely, very pertinent. You know, just yesterday, the Minister of Education intervened with a tweet with students who had made an independent, independent decision, uh, which is part of the freedom, you know, academic freedom and intellectual freedom. Um, and, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, Oriel College decided, announced that they were not removing a statue and All Souls has announced that they're not removing statues, which have been flagged up by students and citizens of the city of Oxford as that they're really problematic and painful. So I think that's where, um, that's sort of the context within which our conversations take place. And I think that would be a really lovely moment to take us to Angela to see what's happening. But before I very reluctantly give you up, Lara, there's two things that really jump out to me. One, the consideration that removal is an opportunity for growth, change and the creation of something new. And that it sits very much within the wheelhouse, not just of positivity, but the driver to create something new. And I think the second thing that really leaps out from a uh, a very clear and emotionally articulate perspective is the notion of pausing, considering and reflecting on a response that is created with people, not for people. And I think that's a really, and I'm sorry to let go of you, but this is a gorgeous moment to bring in Angela. Angela, if you would like to bring your screen up. Hi. Hi, Angela. Hello. Uh, Moving on from that, this is where you come into the story in terms of exploring these responses so far to the removal, the engagement that is happening right now on the ground. But having worked with you and had this conversation previously, the sharing that you gave me, I think, was the most emotive that I felt in terms of this conversation and that moved me the most because the discoveries that you made in terms of your research and the application of all these different conversations that we've been having so far into something practical and productive and inclusive that we as learning professionals and we that work in engagement can use, I think is astonishing and beautiful. Can you share your research and what you did at Pete Rivers with us? I can, I can try and do it quickly. <laughs> So uh, firstly, I just have to say that I couldn't I couldn't believe my luck when this opportunity came up, to be honest, for two reasons. One is that I used to live near Oxford. Um, and so I know the museum and uh, I'm fascinated by it. I've always been fascinated by it. But the second reason was that I knew that Pitt Rivers Museum was at the forefront of uh, decolonial praxis, and that's an area of academic interest. So I was already really, really invested in it. So if I give you a brief outline of, of how I approach this research, which, um, as Lara has said, and if you, as you said, John, was looking into the public's response to the removal of human remains. 
And when I first started talking to Lara about this, this is uh, back in December last year, um, she said, I want to know what is being said. And then she said, and also if there's anything that I can't see. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end. So sort of hold that thought. Um, so in terms of research, what I did was to ask what sounds like a very, very simple question. What are people saying about the removal of the Sansa? And by the way, as has already been mentioned, there were 120 human remains removed last summer, of which only 12 were, were Sansa, but that seemed to go on all the attention. And um, that in itself, I think, is interesting. I'm going to just leave that there, but that's an interesting thought. So in order to answer that question, what were people saying? Um, I began to look at the written correspondence, which were the letters and the emails. And as Lara said, they were uh, addressed directly to the director of Pitt Rivers Museum often. And I looked at social media, so Twitter and Facebook. And I wanted to find a way of looking across all those different forms of communication to see what was being said. Um, I started with the letters and uh, very quickly it became clear that there were some words that were coming up again and again. And I described those in the research as trigger words. Um, and those are words that are designed to elicit an emotion from the reader in this case. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail here about what those specific words were and the clue as to why not is in the heading trigger words if you are interested in finding out a little bit more about the language of polarization or a bit more about the research um i do talk about it on a podcast called undoing geography um so i took then that same word logging exercise and applied it to facebook and twitter to see where that got me to now i'm going to actually read some of the um conclusions because uh, I might forget something otherwise. So firstly, the language was very polarized. Now that's not something new, I don't think to any of us. There was no room for nuance. There was no space for the middle ground. And I think that's really hurting us in terms of moving our practice forward. Um, the written responses were mainly negative, uh, over 90% of them on Facebook and Twitter. The posts were less negative, but there were more negative than positive posts. Most of the written correspondence was from men, and that's just a fact, just was. More women than men viewed the social media posts on Facebook and Twitter. And there were a disproportionate number of negative posters. Um, and they were in the center of the Facebook posts in particular. And when I say small, I mean, there was one person who was in the center of almost every conversation that went on, and perhaps two or three others. Um, and I know that's the case because I used social network analysis, um, which is a visual way, excuse me, sorry, a visual way of representing the connections between the posters. And it allowed me to see who was at the center of the conversation. Um, and so I knew that we weren't listening to what people were saying. We were listening to what just a few people were saying. And that's really important because it led me to what I decided to do next, because I could easily have stopped there. Once I knew though, that there was a disproportionate amount of noise that was just being made by a few posters, I began to look to see if there was something else that was being said. And uh, that's because fundamentally, I believe in people. I believe in all of us to be able to solve this. So this time I looked at, at Facebook reactions. So that is the loves, the likes, the emojis. And using that measure of what people were actually saying, I got the opposite result. So over 90% of those reactions were positive. And on Twitter, which is slight, it's slightly different on Twitter because you don't have the range of emotions to opt for as you do on Facebook. But still, there were eight times more positive reactions, more likes than there were negative posts. And I've called that in the research, the quiet voices. And these quiet voices were saying something, but we just couldn't hear them above the noise of people who felt entitled to put pen to paper or thumb to phone. And if you were listening very carefully, you might have been able to piece together just who those quiet voices might be. So I'm gonna go back now to the original 
question and Laura's provocation to me, which was, what were people saying? And is there anything that I can't see? And I think if we're prepared to look beyond those who feel entitled to have their voices heard and listen to these quiet voices or just listening would be a really, really great start. We might be able to hear and see the rich variety of global ontologies and epistemologies, that's ways of seeing and ways of knowing. We might even regain the middle ground and restore some of the nuance and the hope and real debate when we ask about these questions. Angela, I'm so proud to be your colleague. Thank you so much <laughs> for that research and finding something that as engagement professionals, we have as a concrete platform by which to move forward on, a platform hidden through that noise and the, con the contested voices, but speaks unequivocally about positivity and about something productively that we can move forward as a result. And I think particularly as professionals, I would suggest there's, there's a fear in some people around any conversation around decolonization, mm -hmm. that to do so is inherently to be political or that it will make you liable to trolling or pain or emotional toil. Yet through your research and through moving forward through what initially is a miasma of that reaction, you found something that is so useful and emotive and powerful in terms of how we move this conversation forward. I can't thank you enough. My final question before I very reluctantly give you up is what do you hope for in terms of the removal going forward? What I'd love to see in that space is a piece of artwork which allows us all to reflect on who we are as humans and our shared space on this earth. That's what I'd like to see in that space. Angela Billings, thank you so much. And I will see you back for the questions, if that's okay. all right. Yeah, thank you. The sharing that we've had is incredible. We start with Ashley considering the emotional dynamics. We then move to Liam to consider the national dynamics and the wider implications of decolonization. We then went back to Laura to consider engagement and reactions happening right now as a result of the removal before reflecting with Angela on the powerful discoveries that we make when we pause, consider and react not just with the emotion, but we encapsulate all these different responses and find a productive and solid way forward that speaks about inclusion. I would love to hear what you guys think. It would be amazing to share with you now as we go to the question and answer section. Josie, can I check in with you in terms of what's happening in the comments, the emotional tone, what's going on in the sharing and any questions that have come through? Yeah, it's incredible. Hi, John. Thank you to everyone for talking. That was really, really fantastic. Um, the chat has been incredibly busy, so I feel slightly frazzled. I'm trying to pull out uh, the <laughs> we pull out some of the questions that are overlapping. We won't have time to answer everything, but um, there's real sharing in the chat. People are commenting on each other's um, comments, and uh, particularly there's been quite an interesting discussion around um, replication. So three, uh, I don't think we're, we're going to this question because it's been uh, answered quite a lot already in the chat, but around whether 3D printing might be a way forward and obviously ethical issues around uh, you're essentially recreating the object, you're recreating the tra trapping of spirits and things like that. So the answer we think we found in the chat is no, don't don't get your 3D printer out as a way, as a sole rule for, um, for this. Sorry, I've got some, uh, some nephews being very loud in the background who are just leaving the house. Um, so I think one of, there's been some really interesting, I'm just gonna shut my window, I'm really sorry everyone. Sorry, everyone. So one question, uh, some questions have revolved particularly around um, young people in the UK, particularly having their first encounter with a dead body or body parts in a museum and how the museums in general, our approach has been to encourage detachment from what we're viewing. So and I want to just read out a quick comment and see if people might like to respond to this. So someone has said uh, it's really interesting seeing folk talking about their experiences of seeing human remains as children. 
I wonder if part of those reactions has to do with the fact that our society is generally very divorced from death. For many people, this seeing human remains in museums would be their first time seeing a dead body. So I imagine for many, it didn't feel real, but more like a haunted house prop or something upsetting that we had so much, and it's upsetting that we had so much more respect for our own dead than for the dead of the other, as Ashley was saying. And this led on to people talking about um, museums making space for emotion. So I wonder if it might be interesting to comment on the idea of museums asking for detachment from looking at um, human remains and how we might now be having some practice shift where we're inviting an emotion. But how do we do that? How do we ask people to bring emotion into the museum and keep it appropriate and safe? Let's put that to our panel and panel, please do pass over if you prefer not to answer. But let's start with Ashley. What do you think? Um, God, what do I think? Uh, I, I again, I mean, I, not to harp on about it, but it really does come back to this thing of othering because that detachment from looking at human remains, you know, especially when we think about mummies, the, in this case, the shrunken heads, um, it's it's just saying these are different. Therefore, you don't have to have any emotional connection to these things. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's weird, like, you know, the, they were people, and we are people, and why can we not find that, that connection? And I, I suppose it's, it's, you know, perhaps it's, it's done in a way to sort of protect ourselves from not feeling too much when we look at things in a museum, but... Yeah, you know, Josie said, why why shouldn't we feel things when we look around a museum? You know, it's, it's I just think we're, we're sort of slowly trying to remove emotion from looking at things. And it's just really bizarre to do that because it's it's in, it's unhuman like to do that. And collections are designed to garner emotion. That is exactly. their function. They yeah. are not neutral or static objects in any stretch of the imagination their design and function is to elicit emotion. Mm, very Liam. much. John, did you want everyone to respond to that or do you want me to come in with another question? Well, I'm just going to get everyone to respond if that's all right. And then come in with another question. Liam, would you like to respond? Yeah, um, I think I think actually is absolutely right. But I think it's also just like a a wider issue with museums that I don't think museums are very good at being emotional spaces like it's it's bizarre despite despite the exhibitions we you know we see and we put on often wanting to elicit emotion despite the collections often being very emotional as you're walking around a museum space it's still in 2021 feels like if you are loud in a museum or you're talking in a museum you're going to get looked at, you're going to get shouted at, or you're going to get told off. And so how can you have an emotional response to something in a place where you are literally basically told not to, to be doing anything at all, you know, apart from just observing? So I just think museums aren't good at that. And despite what we, you know, say about all the, uh, the emotional intensity of this stuff, and, and it's absolutely right, because it is incredibly emotional when you think about it, the museum space itself doesn't often allow for that to happen. Um, and I think that is a real issue, you know, especially for people of colour, when you're walking around a museum or experiencing a museum and you're seeing things that are related to, you know, something that might happen to your ancestors or something that, you know, really touches you as a person who's, whose family might have been affected by, uh, by uh, colonialism. You, you don't get the chance to process that in the museum, you know, and that's and that is a real problem in itself. And I think that's if, if we're going to actually do something to push museums forwards, you really have to, uh, to work to build a culture that allows for that to happen in those spaces. I agree. And there's a presumption of emotional literacy, not only in terms of the institutions, but in terms of the people that operate inside of them as well. And perhaps we need to challenge that assumption or ask more. For, for the collections and for the institutions that we work with. Laura, 
Yeah, no, I would just agree with what's been said by Liam and Ashley and, and, and also in the chat where uh, people like Megan are pointing out how, you know, this this all has its roots in sort of enlightenment thinking where we've separated emotion from ratio and think that that's what, you know, a, a human reaction would be if we are hoping that museums can be places where, you know, humans actually um, interact with them. They make, I think what COVID has shown is that a museum without people in it is just dead um, and um, I think that's where if we are humanizing museums emotions are an integral part of everything that we are so um, it's it's but it's it, obviously being a university museum the academia and this whole colonial idea of that you know sort of there's certain ways of being that are the norm and that are really uh, sort of the place where knowledge is produced and those are the things that are you know sort of what we should achieve and what we should you know, sort of try to um, strive towards is hugely problematic and colonial and that's exactly what we have to undo and unlearn and and move away from so that emotion is what museums are because emotion is what people are so i think it's it's you know ridiculous that we think that we should separate emotion from ratio but it is grounded in colonial processes of where power is uh, put and i think that is um absolutely um, and some people also in the chat i think point pointing out those whose emotions are we protecting here um, and listening to is really important here. What an incredible point. And I'm so sorry I've not been able to see the chat yet. I've been giving all my love to the panelists, but I will be able to catch up, I promise. Angela. Uh, I think I, I agree with what everybody else has said, actually, but particularly this point about, um, about othering and about whose emotions are foregrounded when you're thinking about othering. Um, my response to standing in front of uh, the dead enemy's case will be quite different from, from somebody else's, I expect. So um, the labelling is also part of, part of that conversation about how we interact when we go around the museum. So, um, yes, sorry, I'm just, I'm just, I'm kind of processing as I'm talking what, <laughs> what this feels like. Um, <laughs> you're the same yeah I, I just think it's important to just keep having the conversation about this being a real in, in this case this being a real person's artifact whether it's a sans or whether it's something else that's in in the um, museum um, and trying to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes which is very very difficult but so necessary M more now more than ever actually I very much agree and if ever engagement could and should work, it's now, particularly in terms of the learning that we have from 2019 and 2020. Uh, Josie, can I check back on you for the emotional temperature and for another question, please? Yeah, so lots more discussion in the chat about emotion, which is yeah, really fascinating. Quite a, people have really strong feelings about how museums are about feelings. <laughs> But they might have been you know, museums that also have been about sciencing those feelings. So Angela, you you mentioned labels, which moves us quite nicely into the next area of questions. So we had quite a discussion in the chat around, uh, I think, in response to um, to Liam's conversations about how we bring context into the museum. So in a in a space like the Pit Rivers, we do have labels, but we also have such a cacophony of visual culture that how do we bring context back into the museum so if there is a case ever a case for retain and explain how might that work or re-display re how might that work in the pit rivers um so Menoir, uh, who's uh, joined us uh, put, put up a question around the case for total removal but on a temporary basis so could we although it might be a huge undertaking could we or should we totally empty an ethnographic museum like the pit rivers and bring in local voices which i think is really crucial bring in local voices and national international thinkers to repopulate that space and bring context in a new way so this the questions were moving around how we bring in context and whether totally empty, emptying a museum might be a good starting place ashley how do we bring in context um that's a big question. Um, I'm not sure how, how to answer that, how to bring context. But well, funny, funnily enough, I spoke to a group of young people um, just last week um, who were also talking about 
how labels in museums um, frequently lack context around objects, especially objects that are contested. And it, you know, there's there's clearly a sort of awkwardness on the museum's part about kind of owning up to the context of those objects. Um, but young people want to see that context there. They want to understand why, you know, these things are so contested and why museums have taken the stance that they have. Um, sorry, remind me of the other bit of the question. Uh, context and uh, would, would total removal or whole scale removal change our perception? Um, would removal change our perception? I mean, well, I guess we'll see with the shrunken heads whether that does change the perception there. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you know, other people have touched on it a lot better that really um, those objects were so kind of poorly labeled before that, um, you know, does removing them really make you know, what difference that really makes now. Um, yeah, sorry, that's not the best answer to that, I realize. It's a beautiful answer. Liam, can I move on to you? Yeah, um, I think the idea of like total removal is really interesting as a, as a concept. I think, you know, when you're looking at, uh, specifically at like decolonization or something, um, a question that's been coming up in my mind again and again more recently is decolonization essentially is essentially you know really trying to change how a museum operates what the status quo of that museum and that space is and trying to bring uh, you know wider perspectives into that and make sure that it is from a position where those perspectives are included from the ground up you know so the thing that i've been wondering is well how can you how can you do that when you're still doing your day-to-day -day business it seems almost at odds completely, doesn't it? And I feel like if museums really want to try and do this or take it seriously, then the, a part of it is perhaps, perhaps museums need to shut for a year or two, to take some full time just to reassess everything um, and, and then come back to, you know, and, and have the opportunity to have those conversations and really just fully engage with what this museum or this space wants to be as you redevelop it and as you think about where it's going in the future because i feel like if, if you're if you're a museum director for especially for example where you are kind of responsible for the direction of the museum uh you can't be thinking about how to change a museum whilst you're also thinking about like um you know how are you gonna pay for the rent for the building or like all those other things or you know it it, it seems like and that's perhaps something that funders can be working on is is how we support organizations to do that you know whether they need to take time out to financially support the, the the ongoing continuation of the organization through that transition process including their staff and uh, making sure that everyone could be involved but ultimately giving them the time and the space to fully engage with the concept i think that's just something that would be really interesting to see yeah. lara that takes us in the conversation to concepts around closure and context, which I think speaks very clearly about the pandemic and what we've just been through. Do you have a perspective on that for us? Yeah, so I think, you know, as I said earlier, um, you know, having been closed for more than a year, uh, you know, on and off, um, it's sort of, on the one hand, I think, you know, this idea of sort of emptying the museum, we've obviously played and toyed with that, but there's so many, you know, spaces already like that, which are these sort of, you know, white, sanitized white cubes, um, which don't do a much better job at, at contextualizing or actually not being spaces of violence. So I think that to me, um, what our task is, is on the one hand to remove the elements that are you know sort of racist and derogatory and, and continuing violence because we're not engaging with it it's going back to what liam was saying and ashley was saying i think also earlier that if you are having 
really problematic aspects of your museum. You need to be really open about it. And that's what we've done. You know, Marenka and others have sort of installed uh, new interpretation in the galleries that engages with some of that. We do, we are very conscious and, and, and I know Samena Sesher, who's the director of the Museum of Color, has very sort of, you know, um, clearly and, 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 and explicitly spoken about how problematic the space of the Pit Rivers Museum is, especially for people who don't come from that side of empire that, you know, sort of um, uh, profited from the accumulation of wealth, but actually suffered its violence. And that, that going into that space, both for indigenous people and people who have roots in, in places that suffered the violence of empire, the museum can be really problematic. And so how, I think what we are trying to see is how can we make the space be a space for conversations while it's not continuing to do violence. I don't know if emptying the space would help. We do know that when there is engagement with contemporary artists, for example, like Nima Droma, who's a Tibetan photographer who's taken over the space, like Christian Thompson, whose incredible uh, photographic work engages with the problems of our space in his museum of others that we've now put very centrally in the in the museum. Uh, and when uh, people like Errol Francis and others have curated you know, sort of aspects of, of work in the museum, it, it suddenly makes the museum a place where these conversations, these necessary conversations about pain and violence and empire can take place. And we're changing our curriculum, changing the offer that we have in the curriculum where some of our you know, education staff is really um, making sure that we can engage with that. We're making sure that we're making space for other narratives. And obviously some of the displays are going to have to be taken um, you know, sort of off display because they are too problematic and they're actually causing damage. But we've always been making changes in the museum, even though the Rivers Museum is sort of seen as this museum of the museum. It's not, none of the 19th century displays have been on display for decades. This has nothing to do with the current curatorial staff or the directors, but we've always made changes to keep it up to date, to keep it relevant to the today. And I think that's what museums need to do. And that sometimes involves working with indigenous communities. For us, that's a really important part of our work. On the other hand, there's also work that we need to do with contemporary artists because they can somehow mobilize spaces completely differently. And then there's work that our curators do. And, and I think they are quite good at being sort of innovative and, and changing. And then there's really difficult, it's, it's not easy, it's a difficult space. It absolutely is. And sometimes when I go to, you know, the, the Rist or I go to, you know, the Ashmolean or I go to Nottingham Contemporary, I think, oh my God, it would be such a relief if we would just have these white walls and, you know, art that you can hang up and it doesn't come with all that baggage. But this is the space that we are curating and this is the space that we've sort of chosen to work in. And, and it's emotional and it's painful and it's difficult and we need to make sure that we are um, moving away from it being such a difficult place to, um, to, to be in, especially for indigenous communities and people who um, you know, have roots and heritage in uh, places that um, suffered its violence. And just, I just wanted to go back very briefly to what Ashley was saying earlier, where this, this idea that, um, that we can just sort of objectify an other and we do that on a constant basis, and it's what we're seeing happening on the streets and in, and in public media, where we feel entitled to other people and therefore disqualify them. And, and, and I think that is, you know, we, we see that we want to not continue to do that in our museum spaces. We want them to be welcoming spaces, but it is very much part of our nature. And that's where we need to sort of change that nature and start from, you know, sort of the, uh, working with schools and working with the curriculum and certainly also changing the curriculum in Oxford, because just looking at who's leading the country right now, many of them were sort of trained in, in Oxford and in Cambridge. And that's where we're trying to also work with sort of lots of our colleagues who are trying to do that work of changing uh, the curriculum in the university. Lara, as someone that has been othered, your warmth and your sharing really jumps out to me on the screen. Thank you so much. Angela, as someone that's created new context, I think you have the last word. Do I? Gosh, um, I don't know that I have anything um, amazing to say because I was just mulling over something that came up actually in a lecture um, 
that Dr. Una Murphy at Goldsmiths was talking about the role of AI. Um, I know this isn't really answering the question, but it was what was going through my head while, I, while you were talking, the role of AI in the museum space. So um, this is sort of machine learning and machine reading to be able to look at an object and tell you what it is you're looking at. So I thought this is, a, this is amazing, you know, this, this would um, remove perhaps some of this, this bias, but actually um, those machines are learning from humans and the humans are biased. So you end up with what she described as bias squared in, in, you know, in your labeling. I just thought that was just such a fascinating, you know, we'd like to be able to remove the emotion, I think, so that we've got a description, a clear description. But um, even when we use computers to do it, it's still us, isn't it? Um, creating what the machines are learning. So I just, uh, sorry, I'm just throwing that in because I thought that was interesting. No, um, I could go off on that tangent for another hour. That's incredible. <laughs> uh, in the comments, we have a couple of minutes left, but please do let us know what you think. This is the part where I thank an incredible, generous panel that I am proud to have worked with in this space. I think one of the things that really leaps out to me in terms of how we're having this conversation around Radical Hope is that an action has happened for positivity and for inclusion. It has created a moment and an opportunity for new creation and togetherness. That creation and togetherness acknowledges disparity of voices, extremity of voices and anger. It also acknowledges that this is not an Oxford centric conversation. This is part of a national and international movement that is happening. A movement that we can either be conscious of and use our privilege to add to or we stand in the way of and communities make their own decisions but ultimately the hope that radiates out to me in terms of having this conversation is what could be achieved what can be achieved and what by harnessing the emotion counter or on both sides that we can come together through in learning to create is humbling that we have the power and potential to make something together. I'm thrilled that our panel in different voices and different levels of expertise and experience have shown how that plays out. Now the conversation moves forward in terms of what it's going to do as part of a wider plan, which I'm thrilled about. I'm thrilled at the removal. I'm proud to be having this conversation and I'm proud to be able to share ideas and learn from everyone in this space. This has been a real privilege, an emotional learning experience, and I'm gonna really treasure my time with you.